I do. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight, and I'm grateful for everyone that came, and I pray that the Lord will minister to your, to your heart tonight. Uh, I know many of you have never met me before. Some of you know me. Uh, some of you are only here uh, because, you know, we're friends. Uh, but for many of you who don't know me, I want to introduce myself. Uh, you know, I came to the Lord 15 years ago. 15 years ago, I had a radical experience and encounter with God. When I was a, a, a troubled youth, uh, addicted to, to drugs and involved in crime and going in and out of juvenile detention centers, and, and God was reaching out to me. He sent Christians who were ministering to me and preaching, and one day I was locked up and I was in my cell and I heard a loud voice preaching, and his voice carried into my cell and it got me up out of my bed, and there's a man in this juvenile detention center preaching about sin and preaching about hell. And the Holy Spirit came into my cell and convicted my heart and took the blinders off of my eyes. There I was, living in all sorts of wickedness and sin, and I always thought I was going to go to heaven when I die. I thought I was right with God. And, and now the blinders were taken off of my eyes, and I saw how wretched I was, how miserable I was, how hell-deserving I was. And I got pierced in the heart with this arrow of conviction. And I roasted in that conviction. I didn't get born again that day. I didn't get saved that day. I roasted in that conviction. It's the oven of conviction. Until maybe, oh, uh, 45 days later. And I read the Bible and I was converted under the preaching of Jesus. I wasn't led to the Lord in a church service. I wasn't led to the Lord... Uh, at a crusade, I came to the Lord through reading the sermons of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said I needed to be born again. And I went and I knelt down and I asked God to make me a new person. And I had a, a, a radically fundamental change done in my heart and life through God. Fifteen years ago, I became a new man. And I've never become the same. I'll never be the same again. It wasn't just a, a change of beliefs. It was a change of heart. You know, salvation is not a doctrine. Salvation is an experience. And I had this experience of salvation when I cried out to God. And He came and He, he transformed the motives of my life. I was no longer living for myself. I was living for God. And he, he changed my perspectives on life. I wasn't just trying to get as much as I could out of life. Now I want to give as much as I can with my life. It was a complete reversal of your character. That's what salvation is. And so the Lord's called me to this ministry of evangelism. I'm called to, uh, I'm a full-time missionary to the United States. And not everyone, you know, is to, called to be a full-time evangelist, but we're all called to share our faith. We're all called to be a witness. We're all called to testify of Christ. If you're saved, you have a, a testimony. You have, you have a... a a story to tell of what Christ has done in your life. And so my ministry is that I travel the country and I preach. I, I shared in the service to the other church this morning when I was 20 years old, I bought a minivan with all the money that I had and a church donated a mattress and I put that mattress in the back of that minivan and I traveled the country with two other buddies. We were all in our 20s, we were single and we just traveled the whole country living out of this van preaching everywhere. We slept at Walmart at night, we cooked our food on camping equipment uh, you know, propane tanks and, and, and we just preached in front of the bars we preached in front of the clubs we went to the universities we went to the colleges everywhere that there was people we brought the gospel to them and I've been full time now for 10 years praise God I'm married and I have children I have, my wife is due with our fourth baby in May and uh, God has blessed us and provided for us as we you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you now, uh, what, what would you think, you know, I, I, I watch the news and I hear these stories and uh, like I was down at uh, South Padre Island in Texas for spring break. I've also done um, Myrtle Beach. Uh, I've done uh, Daytona Beach spring break. And, you know, these people come to the beach and they're partying, they're done with their school for a break and they just want to have a good time and they're drinking and they're drugging and they're sleeping around and there's always reports of someone getting raped there on the beach while uh, other party goers just watch. And that's what happened at South Padre Island 
there, there is this you know, girl passed out on, on alcohol, and, and sure enough, she's being raped right there on the beach while all these people are, well, they're filming it, they're watching it, they're... I mean, what do you think of that? That's pretty rotten, that's pretty wretched, that's, that's pretty evil to see, to see in, in public, for something like that to happen in public. But what do you think the Church of America is doing today as the devil is raping our society before our eyes? And we're just uh, wanting to have a good time and party on the beach and enjoy ourselves. While you see in the news and you see in your own society and you see in your own culture, the devil is raping our society, violating its rights. He's a stealer of souls. And so we're seeing the devil rape our society before our eyes. And there, who are we? Are we going to intervene? Are we going to do something about it? Are we going to interpose? And the, the sad fact is most professing Christians in America do nothing at all. Maybe you watch, maybe you're grieved, but do you intervene? You know, it's like a, a fireman who watches the house burn and does nothing to put it out. It's like a police officer who watches the robbery before his eyes and does nothing to stop it. That's what, that's what the, the majority of the churches in America have become. We have a job to do to preach the gospel. We have a job to do in the Great Commission and to evangelize. And we see the devastation and destruction that the devil is sowing in our society. And most professing Christians do nothing. And in fact, many uh, hinder those who try and criticize those who try. Can't tell you how many critics I have. How many people who, who tell me that I'm, I'm doing it wrong. It's better for, better for you to try and, and do it wrong than to not try at all. You know, uh, it's always better to have uh, your own ministry than to constantly criticize the ministry of others. So I want to share out of uh, Hosea 5.15. This is an interesting Old Testament prophet, Old Testament verse. Hosea 5.15. Here the Lord says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. So here you have God dealing with a stubborn nation, a backslidden people, a hypocritical priesthood. And God gets to the point where he's fed up with it all. He's been reaching out to them and reaching out to them, drawing them, calling them, commanding them, influencing them, striving with them. And they got to this point where God says, I'm going to go. I'm leaving. And I'm going to go to my place, my own place, until they seek me. And I fear that as America has continued and persisted in its backslidden state, that we are on the verge of this very thing, of God taking his hands off. That we're on the verge of this of reprobation. This is a terrifying truth. That if Israel got to the point where God said, enough is enough, I'm done. I'm leaving until you come and seek me. I'm not going to be involved in your life. Until you seek after me, I'm not going to get involved. And if, if Israel got to this point by sinning under the light of the law, well, how much more is America in danger of this sinning under the light of the gospel? And so what we need more than ever, what we need to do more than ever is to seek the face of God. And people say, well, where is God in our society? Where, where is God in our churches? We don't have the manifest presence of God like we ought to. I fear that God left many churches a long time ago and people didn't even notice. Because you can carry on just fine without him in most churches. We don't have the presence of God in our churches like we ought to. We don't have the presence of God in our society like, like He wants to. 
And this is why we haven't sought Him. We need to acknowledge our offense and we need to seek His face. So this is a terrifying truth that, um, that, that you can get, society can get to the point where God gives up on them. And he leaves. So we need to seek God. Another verse I'd like to share, Psalms 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. See, there's a secret place. I believe this verse we just read in Hosea talks, God says, I'm going to go to my own place. And God has a secret place. And to experience God, you need to go to the secret place. I didn't meet God at an altar. I didn't meet God in a church. I didn't meet God in a crusade. I met God in a secret place alone, by myself, in my room with the Lord. So we need to seek God, and we we're promised if you seek, you shall find. So he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now what does it mean to be in somebody's shadow? To be in somebody's shadow, you're close to them. And we need to be close to God. If ever we needed to pursue God and to be close to God, it's now. If ever we needed God to abide in our life, it's now. And in order for God to abide in us, we need to abide in Him. So here it says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of, his, of the Almighty. We need to dwell in His presence. You know, it, we live in a world that's full of distractions, entertainment, movies, television, radio. You can just dwell and live in the ways of the world, be, be entertained. What we need as Christians more than ever is to dwell in the presence of God. Amen. And then we go out from the presence of God into the world with the power of God upon us. Yes. And if we're ever going to change the culture, if we're ever going to win souls, we need to have God living on us, living through us, living in us. And that comes by seeking Him and then dwelling in His presence. Seeking the Lord and dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And only then will we abide in the shadow of the Lord. Now, the closer that you get to God, the more brokenhearted you will be. You know, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Grief is also a fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says, grieve not the Spirit. You know, the Spirit can be grieved and the Spirit is grieved. Bible says he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more Christ-like you are, the more grief, the more brokenhearted, the more agony of heart you will experience. Every year you ought to get closer to God. That means every year you ought to be more grieved than you were last year, more brokenhearted than you were when you started. You know, the natural tendency is the opposite. Well, we become accustomed to the world around us. We become callous to the sins of society. It becomes uh, normal in society and, and then becomes normal to us and, and, and we're not grieved like we ought to be. The closer you get to Jesus and the more Christ-like you are, the more grief, the more agony, the more brokenness of heart you will experience. And don't tell me you're a Christian if you don't have a brokenness of heart. Because to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. And what was Christ? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And if ever we needed to sorrow over society, if ever we needed to grieve over society, it's now. The devil is stealing more souls than ever before, damning more souls than ever before, destroying more families than ever before. If ever there is an occasion to grieve, it's now. So we need to seek God. And we need to dwell in His presence. And we need not to resist this brokenness of heart that he'll share with us. One of the greatest experiences that I've ever had, I was praying and asking God to share with me his heart. Have you ever prayed, God, you know, I want my heart to break for what your heart breaks for? We sing that, but do you experience that? You really want your heart to break like his heart breaks? One of the greatest experiences I've ever had, there I was, and I was walking through my house, and I had been praying for God to, you know, give me his heart, give me his eyes. But at the moment, I wasn't praying, and I'm just walking through the hallway of my house. 
and wasn't even thinking about God. I wasn't praying, and, and then unexpectedly, I wasn't, ex I wasn't asking for it. I didn't see it coming. So I, the Holy Spirit came crashing down upon me. And, and I, I had never been to like a charismatic service or anything of the kind, but there I am, just walking through my house, and the Holy Spirit came crashing down upon me. And my knees gave out. I couldn't stand. And, and I, I couldn't help it. I fell to the floor and I began to weep and to cry as thoughts filled my mind of how lost, how dark, how, how damned the society around me was. And I felt like God was opening up his heart and sharing with me his grief. And I was experiencing, I, I was suffering the sufferings of God. And I, I've never experienced anything quite like it ever since. I didn't know that there was such an experience. It just happened. And so the closer you get to God, the more grieved you will be. And, and that's what we need. We, you know, there's joy in the Lord. I, I've never been happier than ever before. I, there's joy in, his, in holiness. The world knows nothing of pleasure. The, the, the world knows carnality. The world knows entertainment. The world knows nothing of the pleasures of the soul. Like we know. But, but it's not enough just to have the joy of the Lord. We need the grief of the Lord in our day and age. So we seek Him. We find Him. We then need to tarry in His presence. And it says in Luke 24, 49, that we're supposed to tarry until you be endued with power from on high. You know why we don't have the power that we ought to have? You know why we don't have the power they had at Pentecost? You know why we don't see the manifestations and the healings and the power of God in converting the masses like the apostles had? Because we're not tarrying in His presence. And what we need more than it, we don't need... The church is full of hype when it needs to be full of the Holy Ghost. We don't need more business, we need more brokenness. We don't need, uh, we don't need more CEOs, we need more criers. You know what's more useful to God? Not a million dollars. God can do without a million dollars. You know what's more useful than a million dollars? A broken heart. God can use a man with a broken heart in greater ways than he could use a millionaire. You look at the book of Acts. What did Peter say? Silver and gold have I none. But what I have, I give unto you. Now, there's many preachers today who have silver and gold, but they don't have the power that Peter had in the book of Acts. Because we're not tarrying in his presence. He says, tarry until you be endued with power from on high. How's your secret life? How's your life of prayer? Yeah, our greatest weapon is our most neglected. If we're going to do battle with the devil in society, if we're going to pull down strongholds, if we're going to establish the kingdom of God, we need to use our weaponry. And prayer is our greatest weapon. It's as if God is just waiting. There he is, just standing back saying, put me in. Just give me the green light. Invite me to come. And then as soon as you pray, you see God move. But oh, think of all the missed opportunities. Oh, think of all the times we should have prayed and we didn't. Th think about when we get to heaven and we see all that we could have done, but we didn't do. All the power that was right there at our fingertips. And God says, look what I could have done. If you had just prayed like you ought to and fasted like you ought to, witnessed like you ought to. But you didn't. I think that's going to be the great tragedy in heaven. You say, oh, there's no tears in heaven. Oh, no, he says, I'm going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's going to be tears at the judgment seat. There's going to be tears when we get there, when we see everything that we could have done that we didn't do. So the greatest, the greatest means that we have is prayer. God uses prayer. It's as if, like John Wesley said, God does nothing but by prayer. But God does everything by it. The most neglected things in the church today. The two most neglected things in the church today is the prayer meeting and the street meeting. And that's exactly what the church needs to get back to. We don't, we don't need the big screen TVs. 
We don't, we don't need the pizza parties. We don't need the, the Six Flags uh, youth, uh, you know, out, you know. It's a sad day when, when the church will have a bigger Super Bowl party than it has a, uh, for prayer meeting. More people show up for the Super Bowl party than for the prayer meeting. When we're more fascinated with the world than in love with God. What the church needs to get back to, like I preached at the earlier uh, this morning at this other church, was just the basics, the fundamentals. The purity, the prayer, the preaching. That's what we need. You know, there's great power God has given to the prayer meeting. He says, if two of you can agree as touching anything regarding the earth, it shall be done. I have a, I have a prayer meeting at my house when I'm not traveling. And I see God move in, in amazing. We pray for something and it happens. Not just small things, big things. I, I can't even, I'm not even going to testify because I don't, I don't want you to be jealous of all the things that God has done. I'm not joking. I, I could tell you I prayed for this and God get it. And you'd be, you'd be jealous at what God has given me in answer to prayer. You know, private prayer is more useful to God than public preaching. As great as that is, and as needed as that is, we, what we need in the church today and in society today is people who will live a secret life of prayer. Every revival throughout history has been... Uh, the, the, the way was paved through the secret lives of prayer of Christians. Every revival in history comes as a result of prayer. And we can say, oh, we need revival. We need revival. We need a revival preacher. No, we don't need a revival preacher. We need a revival prayer. Someone who's going to pray. And we need the street meeting. The, the gospel belongs on the street. The gospel belongs in the open air. The gospel belongs in the ears of the lost. And those who need it the most often hear it the least. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And you just have to open up your eyes. You see the perishing all around us. And we think, oh, what a, how, how can somebody be at the beach and, and, and see some, some woman being raped and not do anything? How can, how can somebody do that? Well, how can the church sit back while well, the devil's raping our society? How can we do that? Well, we see with our own eyes the perishing masses. Of course it's worse. I'm tired of seeing the devil triumph in our society. We're losing time. You know, hey, have you ever said, oh, I have time to kill? You, you don't have time to kill. You don't have any time to kill. There's no time to waste. How much time have you wasted in your life? You know, you, you never want to kill time because you can never resurrect it. Once it's dead, it's gone. You can never resurrect the time that you've killed. So we're losing time, we're losing souls, we're losing a generation, we're losing a culture. You know, the, the, the devil's kingdom in our society is growing. The devil is the biggest youth pastor in America, and, and the churches are shrinking. Uh, statistically, you know, we're losing the cultural war. What we need is more people who are scared for the state of America and where we're going. What we need is more, more hatred for sin, more anger at the devil. We certainly don't see enough of that. Jesus Christ loved righteousness and hated iniquity. You ought to have a, a baptism of holy anger, a baptism of holy hatred. When you see the devastation that sin has caused in our society, I know from experience what sin does. I see how it's ravaged my family, destroyed my family. I know the pain that sin causes. So, of course, I get angry at sin. And so does God. And we ought to be the same. You know, Ezekiel 22, verse 30 says, God sought for a man, one who would make up the hedge, and he found none. You know, God uses men. Like E.M. Bounds used to say, you know, 
not methods, not machines, men. That's what God uses. He looks for a man, a willing vessel. One man who is submitted to God, who is filled with God, who is commissioned by God, who has the fire of God, can make up the hedge. He says, I sought for a man who would make up the hedge that I would not destroy this people, but I found not. And so implying that if he had found a man, if he had just found one man, he wouldn't have destroyed him. The nation would have been spared. And so that's what we need. We need men and women of God who will submit and yield their life in total and complete consecration to God, sanctification, dedication to God for the purposes of God in your life. You know, serving God is not just for, well, pastors or missionaries. Every one of us, has, has a, has, God has a will for our life, a purpose for our life, people for you to reach. Maybe orphans for you to save, homeless for you to feed, prostitutes for you to reach. The church is not supposed to be a cruise ship on its way to paradise. It's a battleship stationed at the gates of hell. Amen. We're going to be waging war through prayer and through preaching, witnessing and testifying. So we need to get back to the prayer meeting and we need to get back to the street meeting. You know, we just had, uh, now it's 2016. Man, time just passes away. Time is speeding like a bullet towards judgment. And every, we lose, well, we lose a year every year. <laughs> you never get it back. And so it's 2016. What's your New Year's resolutions? Oh, you, people want to lose weight. People want to start a business. You know, all I want this year is to know God better than I did last year. I want to get closer to God than I was before. I want to seek God like I've never sought Him before. I want to pray like never before, fast like never before, preach like never before. In the past, oh, I want to, you know, write more books, or I want to travel more, I want to preach more. No, I just want to know God more than I've ever known Him before. And I challenge you to do the same. Because what this society needs is a people filled with God, because it's overwhelmed right now with people full of the devil. If we don't break, our society will. So my message is this. We need to seek God like never before, and we need to seek souls like never before. And God can do great things. God can do wonderful things when He finds a willing people who are submitted and surrendered, who live by faith and trust Him and obey, do whatever He asks you to do, go wherever He tells you to go, say whatever He tells you to say. We can be a light in this culture. We can be a light in this society. Don't get there on Judgment Day. Don't get there before His throne. And He shows you all the things that He could have done with your life. And He shows you all the ways that you've neglected it. All the sins of omission. All the prayers you should have prayed, but you didn't. All the people you could have reached, and you didn't. Yeah, don't, don't wait until that day to mourn over missed opportunities. Let us seek those opportunities while we still can. So I'd like to open it up to some prayer and some altar time. If you feel the Lord's been, been speaking to you, putting things on your heart, maybe you need to dedicate and consecrate your time more than before. You want to seek the Lord in prayer and in fasting like never before. If you want God to use you like never before, let's just spend some time seeking His face and allowing His Spirit to minister to us. Amen.